to come in. And we have a very full agenda for the next two sessions. Um, so welcome to uh, the second day of our user and developers meeting. And um, today we have two back-to-back -back sessions that are our use cases exchange. The first session, the one we're in now, um, is looking at those use cases that are part of the Helix Plus project directly. We have a little bit of a deeper dive on those use cases. There's six of them. Um, the structure of this particular session is that there are five minutes for each of the use cases to present. You'll hear one that's two part that gets a little extra time. Um, and we'll, I'll use this little timer you can see in the corner to hopefully you can see. Oh, it looks like you, yeah, hopefully you've been asleep the timer. Um, so the presenters are aware of that time limit. Um, and then we do have, after each presentation, a couple of minutes, uh, too, for any quick clarifying questions. And then if things go on schedule, we also have a little bit of time at the end to uh, answer questions and have those discussions as well. Um, so let me go ahead and get started with a little bit of backup material. So first off, just a couple of reminders of uh, ground rules for our virtual meeting. Uh, please make sure you're muted unless you're speaking. Uh, encourage folks to use video if they are asking questions, raise their hand. We'll also um, keep monitoring the chat window for um, questions, both that may be discussed orally, but also that might be able to be answered by others in the chat window as we go. Um, so we'll, we'll do our best to stay online and um, we'll certainly uh, on time, and then we'll have a little bit of time in this particular session for some questions and answers. Um, as a preview to the second session, uh, we will need to switch to a different call. That information comes up at the end. Um, and that second session, we'll look at, um, we call it our lightning round, a showcase of a, a large number of other use cases that are using Helix, but are not necessarily part of the Helix Plus project directly. Um, and so there's a total of 20 presentations. So like you said, the lightning round there um, that we'll, we'll have a little more information on next. Um, so just overall, this is the agenda for our whole workshop. Um, we're now down here on the second day, looking at session one currently, and then in a little bit, uh, session two of existing and ongoing use cases. Um, for those who were unable to attend to the introduction or getting started with Helix sessions yesterday, um, Jason has pasted into the chat for this meeting a link to that information, um, where we have already posted YouTube videos for those two. We will be posting those videos for all these, although the use case sessions might be slightly delayed as we confirm the last uh, set of approvals for being posted publicly. Um, and then looking ahead to tomorrow, there are three sessions all around kind of the core tool, the developers presenting their updates, both on the sort of core space and in the usability area, as well as a feedback session, the user session to hear specifically from the users of Helix about what, what's new, what's next, and, and what do you need. Um, Note here, if you want calendar invites for those call in, you can contact uh, D at the link there. So um, just to kind of kick off this session, as I mentioned, session one is around the Helix Plus use cases. And uh, we put together six. You can see them listed there on the side. We'll go through all those in order. Um, perhaps it's fitting that uh, the natural gas use case 4.4 has got the longest text. It, there's sort of two parts of that one. So here are two different presenters. Um, on the natural gas grid use case or parts A and B basically. Um, but why were we doing these, right? So Helix Plus has a project uh, funded by the current round of uh, Grid Modernization Lab uh, call funding um, was partially developed, uh, partially awarded to continue to develop Helix, which you'll hear a lot more about tomorrow. You heard a little bit of the introduction tomorrow, uh, yesterday. Um, but also we, we recognize that doing that in a vacuum is, is usually much less effective than if we can engage with actual use cases and in particular focus on engaging with industry partners for those use cases to make sure that what we're doing is relevant to the broader um, energy systems community um, and let that be a, a feedback cycle to the helix plus development and so you'll hear as we go through these both uh, an example of what the use cases are doing um, specifics of what they've been up to, what their goals are, latest progress, path forward, but also a bit of a tie to the Helix connection. You know, what are they doing in the Helix space? Um, what are things that are being pushed or demanded or, or like how are they interacting with that development? So without further ado, um, let's move on to our first uh, use case. Um, this is a 4.1 of Transactive Communities um, and our presenter for this will be Manish. Thanks, Brian. Uh, hi, I'm Monish, a PhD student at Washington State, and we'll be presenting the use case on 
uh, transactive communities uh, developed through a collaborative uh, initiative between Pacific Northwest National Lab and Washington State University. Next slide, please. Yeah, so basically we all are aware that distribution systems are evolving towards a more actively managed networks with the increasing penetration of DERs and increasingly smart consumers. So customers are becoming more prosumers as they can proactively manage their act generation and consumption. So therefore, uh, they're more interested towards consumer centric economies. So uh, electricity markets are also evolving. Uh, there are future electricity market models that have been uh, proposed like peer to peer markets and community based markets. Through this use case, we'll basically be trying to develop a framework for evaluating community-based markets where a group of prosumers pool resources to form a community. We're calling it as a transactive community. This simplifies the interface to transact energy with neighboring communities and compute with the DSO. So uh, this is the overview of the coordination architecture. The stakeholders are the prosumers with the DERs. Uh, they pool together to form communities and then they transact energy with the neighbors and the DSO, which acts as an interface to the wholesale market. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the uh, market clearing mechanism, basically solving an optimal coordination problem, focusing on maximizing social welfare for the most optimal allocation of resources. As you know, the market is inherently decentralized in nature to keep minimum information sharing and robustness to failure of a single community. We are implementing consensus plus innovations algorithm to this. Uh, next slide, I think it has an animation, Brian. Can you do one more tap? Perfect. So, so basically what's happening is that individual prosumers are basically communicating their flexibility to a community manager, which aggregates or pools the resources together and then starts uh, sending incremental price and quantities to each other in a distributed manner until they converge to a solution. That's the cleared price, which is communicated back to the prosumers for allocation. We solve this market in two steps. One is uh, multi-step once per day and single step real time, which emulates the wholesale, uh, the day at real time for the wholesale market as well. So next slide. So uh, we have tested this on uh, for the for the first for the first case study on the 123 node system. We have highlighted different uh, communities in there. The communication link sort of discuss of how the how the data are being exchanged for each market clearing interval. You can see some uh, market cleared prices. Uh, the blue one is the DSO time of use tariff, and then the orange and the green are the real time and day ahead cleared prices. As you can see, it sort of follows the DSO price for the most of the day, except for the time when the DSO peaks. That's when the community sort of shift, shift to alternating uh, generating resources, and that's why they also shift to the prices. Uh, this curve sort of shows the DSO dispatches. Uh, so they, the DSO basically supplies all the demand for major part of the day, except for the time when there is a peak where the community shift towards internal generation and do not take any power from the DSO. That's where the DSO import is zero, resulting in uh, no export from the DSO operating as island. So this enables them to operate as grid edge. Uh, another tap, Brian. So we have tested this on some existing transactive uh, cases like price responsive cases and base cases, and we have found out uh, another tap, Ryan. Uh, we have found out that the, that the decentralized case gives us a lot of savings, even when the communities are not, like the prosumers are not expressing flexibilities. This is because they're operating on a different price set altogether. Next slide. So in terms of Helix, uh, we have uh, this, uh, these are some numbers on the co-simulation overview. Uh, we have 200 plus Helix endpoints with adjustable delay filters. This has been done to emulate com communication in the distributed data exchange. Uh, this figure shows basically when there is asynchronism, when the data, when the incremental price and quantities are being exchanged, results uh, so the market to not converge. Those spikes are basically the intervals where the market has failed due to asynchronism in the data exchange. Uh, we'll focus into one particular market failure instance. Uh, next tap, Brian, another one. Uh, so this shows that for that specific interval where it failed, uh, the iterative lambdas were asynchronous, and that's why they started diverging to a place where uh, things didn't converge, and that's why we get uh, erroneous allocations, whereas we have developed a robustness algorithm where which would preserve the synchronism in the iterative updates, and Helix sort of facilitate to uh, test this. Next tap. Run. Yeah, so in terms of development, we were uh, through this use case, we were able to identify some bugs related to Helix Prime grants. Uh, we were able to suggest some uh, uh, Helix, some some attributes for the Helix COM module that would be more that would make the whole market uh, mechanism more sophisticated. And uh, we were also working, we are currently working on benchmarking the core performance for large scale implementation of the distributed algorithm. Uh, final slide. Next, yeah. So basically we have got this framework uh, on, in terms of future work, we're working on increasing the scalability and test it on HPC using MPI core. Uh, 
also working on some uh, aspects of preserving fairness and the evolving the role of community manager. Uh, the next, the next slide. Thank you. So, any questions? Excellent. Yeah, I think we have time for uh, one question. Is there any? So that will. Thank you, Monish, for the um, great presentation. Uh, we do also have a, a chance at the end of uh, this session to have a more open uh, discussion among the different use case teams. So we'll, we'll invite all our presenters back at that point if there's more um, overarching questions for folks. Um, the last call for any questions? Great, well, thanks so much. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation then. Um, Ananta from uh, NRECA. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sananta Narayanan. I'm a data scientist at NRECA, and I joined the Helix Plus team late last year. Uh, the goal of our partnership is to integrate Helix with Essence, which is a framework developed by NRECA for monitoring OT behavior and grid physics data. As a first step, though, we are developing a Helix co-simulation for detecting anomalies in distribution circuits using machine learning, and that is what I will be talking about today. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what we mean by anomalous events here are things like uh, equipment malfunction or energy theft that result in energy losses and costs both to the uh, consumer and the utility. Now, by some measures, typical buildings consume 15 to 30 percent more energy than necessary, and power theft uh, has cost about 6 billion annually, and these numbers are from studies from a few years ago. And machine learning has proven useful in many other domains in detecting anomalies. Uh, however, it requires large amounts of data to train the machine learning model, uh, especially labeled data where the anomalous condition is known and explicitly identified. And uh, testing these models is also difficult as anomalous activity is usually only a small portion of normal behavior. So with a Helix, uh, with a um, Helix uh, co-simulation, uh, it allows us to generate large amounts of labeled data and uh, easily introduce uh, different types of anomalies into the study. And uh, this allows us to test our machine learning models and get a good understanding of the performance of the machine learning models. And it's useful for comparing the cost savings uh, from early detection uh, when the machine learning models are deployed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in this study, we simulate some specific types of anomalies and use supervised learning to detect them. Um, uh, and we generate labeled data for these specific types of anomalies to train the machine learning model. So far, we have studied uh, equipment malfunction, which is simulated by adding a large load behind the meter. And we have focused on artificial neural networks as our machine learning algorithm. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this shows our workflow. Uh, it has three parts. Uh, we first run a co-simulation to generate the training data. And then the machine learning model training happens offline uh, using the generated data. And then uh, in the testing phase, we run a new uh, Helix co simulation to test the machine learning models. So, in the data generation step, we modify the Grid Lab D model to be able to simulate anomalies. Uh, in this case, we studied equipment malfunction, which is simulated by adding a large load behind the meter. Uh, the anomaly agent is a federate in the Helix simulation that randomly activates the anomaly load in the Grid Lab D model. So uh, the anomaly happens at uh, random intervals. And uh, the data from the meter that is attached to this load is saved for machine learning training. And then we go to the offline training phase uh, where we use the generated data to train a machine learning model, in this case, a, a neural network model. And then we save the machine learning model. And then uh, in the testing phase, we run the grid lab D simulation again, uh, and the anomaly federate again randomly activates uh, the um, anomaly load, so injecting the anomaly randomly uh, at random times. And then we use the monitor, we use a monitoring federate, which is a separate federate that uses the um, uh, pre-trained machine learning model, and it reads the meter data from the grid, grid lab D simulation and checks for anomalies. And when an anomaly is detected, it activates a restore operation, which communicates to the Grid Lab D simulation to restore normal operation. So we run the simulation over a period of time uh, where the anomalies are injected at multiple times at multiple locations in the Grid Lab D model. 
and we see how quickly the monitoring agent is able to detect the anomalies and uh, restore uh, normal operation. Um, could you go to the next slide? Yeah, um, so this shows the confusion, uh, confusion matrix uh, of our initial results for detecting the equipment malfunction. Uh, we see that uh, it, it function was detected correctly about 93% of the time, uh, and there is a small amount of false positives and a uh, smaller amount of false negatives. Uh, so this is our uh, initial results uh, from just studying one type of anomaly. Our next steps are to simulate other types of anomalies. Uh, we have uh, figured out ways of simulating uh, these anomalies in the GridLabD model. And uh, our current study uses a daily load profile for the GridLabD simulation. We'd like to extend it to uh, include seasonal variations and see how the machine learning model performs in that. Um, and our long-term goal uh, is to integrate this with Helix's, uh, uh, use the lessons learned from this uh, study and then use that to integrate uh, Helix with NRECS Essence framework. Uh, next one. Yeah, uh, uh, next slide. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, yeah, that's it for today. If you have any questions. Thanks, Ananta. Um, looks like we may have a question in chat here. Um, I'll read it out. It says, nice. Will class imbalance and lack of generalization capability of machine learning models limitations for anomaly detection? Um, and then there's a second question about any limitation of the proposed model. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, we haven't uh, studied class imbalance to a great degree because we are simulating the um, uh, the anomaly, so uh, I was able to introduce a sufficient uh, amount of anomaly for it to be uh, detected, but uh, those are concerns, so uh, we will be investigating the machine learning model more carefully uh, to see uh, how it performs when uh, we haven't specifically accounted for uh, class imbalance in this case, uh, but that is something we will be doing in future work. And that is uh, one of the limitations. Uh, the the other limitation is that uh, uh, the 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 profile of the anomaly changes depending on the the type of load and uh, uh, the other loads attached uh, to that meter and things like that. Uh, and so the general generalization is uh, an issue, and we will be studying it uh, by you know working more with this example. Great. Thanks, Ananta. Um, I think we have time for one other quick question. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any in chat or not hearing. So uh, thanks again, Ananta, for the great presentation. I think we'll go ahead and move on to our next presenter, um, which will be Otto Latif from InRel, talking about the TND co-convergence with commercial tools. Hi, guys. My name is Adil Latif, and I'm a senior engineer at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And I've been leading the task 4.3, which is TND co-convergence with commercial tools. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the overarching objective of this task is to demonstrate Helix-based uh, TND co-simulation with widely used commercial tools. So we've got two objectives here. One, we, we want to uh, to reach out to commercial partners, uh, make Helix uh, much more acceptable in the in 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 community, right? And the second part is to show that we're able to use Helix with existing tools without modifying them. Uh, we have Sim as a partner on this effort. Uh, we in and the initial part effort was to develop robust Helix interfaces for the commercial tools that we're using in this effort. Uh, so we already have uh, developed a, a Helix interface for Sign, which is open source, uh, and uh, Sign Desk. And then for the transmission side, we're using PSSE, and we've got a, a, a robust Helix interface developed for that piece as well. Uh, for, uh, as as parts of data sets, we're using for the distribution side, we're using smart DS distribution models. Uh, so these these and we use using the San Francisco Bay Area model to be specific. Uh, it is a very large data set. We we are using a hundred instances of sign, which means we, we we're checking at scalability as well. We've got 1.4 million electrical nodes. We've got hundreds of thousands of loads in the dis on the distribution side. On the transmission side, we're using Texas and AM synthetic models, uh, as you see in the figure above on the right hand side, top corner. Uh, we, we are currently using the synthetic work model, uh, but we intend to use uh, both the Texas and other pieces as well as we move forward, as we as we scale our as we set as we just decide to lock down our use cases. 
uh, we will be creating open source examples as well so that the community uh, is able to, to work with the models that we're creating given that they're open source uh, for the open source examples we'll be using matpower and in pydss which is in which is a a high level interface to open dss with 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 the helix interface enabled next slide please uh, uh, so we've already built out, uh, we're building out Helix interfaces for the transmission and the distribution system. Uh, so when I talk about core simulation, there are typically two types. There is loosely coupled core simulation, as you see the image on the right, where you're, where you're exchanging information one, one time during each time interval and you move forward in time. Then there is a tightly coupled core simulation where you're exchanging multi information between multiple factors multiple times before you move to the next time step. Uh, we're developing methods to overcome core convergence challenges. Uh, and when, when I talk about core convergence, this is I'm talking about the tightly coupled core simulation when we're exchanging multiple simulation um, information multiple times before we converge and move forward in time. Uh, there are both continuous and discrete components, for example, tap changers uh, that may lead to divergence in a solution. So, so one of the one of the major tasks of this effort is to develop methods uh, uh, that help with the core convergence. Uh, two major pieces that we want to highlight is we want to look at methods that do not add computation overhead and that this and also methods that scale well when you scale up the core simulation. Uh, and finally, the final approach is we're defining use cases to test the efficacy of the developed methods against various sensitivities. Uh, currently, we're looking at number of pub subs, uh, number of federates in, in, in a federation uh, control parameters for say a tap changer and stuff like that. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got uh, we've got the Helix interface at this point built out. Uh, so the the use case I show you here is uh, is, is 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 a core simulation between the Texas A&M WEC model and which is running in dynamic mode, and and the 13 node test feeder which is running on the distribution mode. At the first look, you see that uh, you see three uh, keys in in the plot here: transmission only. So we, where we only run the transmission model, then we ran the transmission distribution in a non-iterative mode, loosely coupled, and then the tightly coupled mode. Uh, uh, can you press the button, please? Uh, so what you zoom, once you zoom in, you see that there is slight differences in in uh, in the core simulation approach, whereas uh, I know this is not a very interesting use case to, to look at, but uh, we'll, we'll, in the future, we'll be looking at much interesting use cases. Uh, next. Uh, another interesting aspect that I, I was looking at is that Given that it, you iterate a, a few times before uh, moving to the next time step, you see that in the in the tightly coupled mode, you you actually converge faster. Next next slide, please. Uh, and also here, what you see is that there is some jaggedness in in the in the power uh, at the distribution side, whereas you see a smoother trend uh, on when you do a, a tightly coupled core simulation. Next slide, please. Getting there. Uh, yeah, so uh, when I talk about Helix, I've, I've had different experiences working with different types of interfaces. Uh, working with with PSSC was was a lot more difficult. Uh, it has a much lower level interface, thousands of function calls that we had to wrap around. Uh, we've developed uh, profile managers and result managers for for certain uh, core simulation pieces as well, and and uh, it is evident in the next. And why we did that? Given that they have internal mechanisms to manage results and profiles, this is going to be in the next slide, which is the final slide. Well, animation across the bottom here. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so the so the path forward is is we are developing the co co converges helper federate that will that would allow you to co converge in a in a, in a in an easier manner. So each federate is a black box to us, right? Uh, and what we want to do initially is develop these methods that help federates to co converge uh, in, a, in an easier manner. The initial prototype I've been developing uses SciPy's wrapper over Sandal Solver. Uh, and this is a centralized approach. Uh, questions we are asking at this moment is, will, will, will scaling be an issue? Can a distributed approach be utilized, uh, which is the images you see on the right side? And uh, in the final piece would be developing interesting use cases. Uh, where we either see divergence and see how how our how our how our methods improve that, or at least where we see a lot of uh, iterations required to co-converge, and we see if we are able to improve upon that. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, any questions here? 
Great, thanks, Otto. Um, I, there is a question in chat from Carlton around uh, with the MATLAB license restrictions. Is that a viable open source solution for the large T and D simulation? Uh, yeah, we, we we can potentially use uh, an an open source version there as well. Uh, I haven't actually looked into that piece at the moment. Uh, uh, we've been working on the on the on the larger use cases, this is the sign models, uh, the the PSSC model, getting them to work together. Uh, which was um, was challenging to say the least. Yeah, but uh, we, I haven't actually started working on the open source models, which which I expect to do in the next few weeks. Uh, and 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 of course, I'll I'll, I'll look for for an, for an open source uh, transmission solver as well. Great, thanks, um, Jing. I do see you have a question in comments, but um, I think we I'm going to ask you to hold that till the end. Um, just so we can kind of stay on track. We still have three more use cases to get to. Uh, so we'll, hopefully things will wrap up a little bit quicker and we'll be able to get to that during the, um, the, the common question. Okay, so thanks so much, Adil. Um, we'll move on to our next presenter. Um, this this next session, uh, next section, we have um, the two parts basically for this presentation because there are um, sort of, you'll hear in a second, sort of two sub use cases within the natural gas grid. And so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Brian Sergi um, talking about sort of a focus on the single tool versus co-simulation -sim validation. And, and you'll hear uh, in this case, the partners are with N Encore. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, as Brian mentioned, this is sort of part one of the two part natural gas use case. And this is work we're doing with our partner Encord. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Brian. There you go, thanks. Um, so I think as many will know, the natural gas and electric sectors have become increasingly coupled in recent years. Gas fired generators are now a big part of uh, not only electricity generation, but they're actually a big source of demand on the natural gas side. Um, this has a lot of benefits. You know, we've seen reduced costs due to low cost natural gas. Uh, certainly more flexibility on the grid, uh, lower CO2 emissions, but there's also a lot of challenges with this, right? And we've seen this particularly in some winter storm events, uh, such as the 2014 polar vortex, which affected PJM in the Northeast. And then more recently, the 2021 winter storm in Texas, where uh, a good portion of generators uh, were out due to lack of gas, abil gas availability due to competing demands with other sectors or uh, gas wellheads freezing compressor stations not having power, things like that. And so all this illustrates the need for sort of more comprehensive modeling that will integrate uh, gas and power sectors. Uh, and some of those linkages are shown sort of on this plot to the right. Brian, you can go to the next slide. So the approach for this task is basically uh, a couple of things. First, we wanted to set out creating a common interface, which would be sort of a framework for how we might co-simulate gas and power sector operations. This included sort of high level ideas of what parameters should be passed, but then also developing a code base that would enable uh, co-simulation with uh, various existing tools. From there, we've also been spending time uh, developing actual Helix bindings for a specific tool. Uh, for our case, for NREL's work, we're working with Encore Saint tool, which does uh, transient gas modeling. Um, and then Argon will talk about their work in this space in a minute. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to take those Helix bindings and then publish them in an open source way. So making this kind of available to folks to see how we've approached this problem. And you know, once we've done all this, we have some tools that I think we can answer some interesting questions. Um, and so we'll hope to examine some, some exciting use cases from there. Next slide, Brian. So what we've done so far, and Brian, you can hit uh, two more times because there's some animations. Um, so far, we're, we're getting pretty close to a, a prototype of a Helix adapter for uh, Encore's Saint tool. Um, and we've been basically testing this out with a test system that has uh, a natural gas network with some coupled natural gas fire generators and some compressor stations. Um, and you can see the map on the bottom showing the coupled nodes there. The plots on the right are basically showing a, a case for a single time step where we're iterating between the gas and electric federates. And basically what we're finding is these coupled nodes, uh, initially the gas network has uh, below minimum requirements for delivery pressure. And so that results in active power being reduced at those generators until the pressure requirements are met. Uh, and you compensate that with 
you basically other dispatch from generators that wouldn't have been dispatched originally in the optimal power flow. So this is illustrating we've got some successful communication, at least for this test system. Next slide, Brian. In terms of highlights, uh, this is sort of one of the few use cases that is using C Sharp. Um, so we're developing an interface in C Sharp. Um, we're passing information via publications and subscriptions in this co-iterative fashion. So using the Helix iteration support with their timing requests. Um, and ultimately, you know, we've been working a lot with Argon to try to create this standardized APA for API for gas grid co-simulation. Next slide. On the path forward, you know, one of the things that Brian alluded to is this excited opportunity to compare uh, co-simulation results. So using Saints gas and grids uh, tool communicating via Helix with the co-optimized results uh, using an integrated approach with Saint. I think that's going to give us a nice window into one is the communication working, but two, how different of results can we expect from the co-simulation approach? Uh, that's sort of the hallmark of this, this Helix approach. Next slide, Brian. So that's it for me. Happy to take questions. This is my contact information. I'd love to hear from folks who are interested in this work. Great. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, I, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and I'll move to uh, Karthik's presentations. And then we'll pause at the end for um, questions to both sessions or uh, sections around the 4.4 use case. Sounds good. Cool. So uh, Karthik, uh, and this, as we mentioned, is kind of the second part here. There's a little bit more of a focus on the operational cooperation, but as you just heard from Brian and you'll soon hear from Karthik, there's also a lot of synergies in terms of developing common interfaces and, and other aspects. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you can hear me well? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Brian. Uh, could you move to the next slide, please? So this is a, this is a work um, you know that is uh, that is fundamentally different from um, you know the co simulation work that we've been doing for quite a while now. Um, so the difference comes from the fact that this is a co optimization problem, right? So um, so when we were looking at uh, selecting the use case for um, you know for this particular Helix Plus project, one of the key aspects was to um, how we can feed into the Helix Plus development, right, or the Helix core development. So co-optimization is an area that we found that uh, you know we could improve upon. Uh, so that's why that's why we chose this uh, particular use case. So having said that, uh, this is uh, you know some of the work that um, I'll be presenting today, and as part of this use case uh, was uh, you know is a, is a continuation of the prior work that we have done uh, at Oregon. Um So so here what we are seeing is we are trying to couple both the NG side and the electric grid side, and then try to do a multi-period co-optimization between the two, right? So there are a few key points to note here. Um, one of the things is uh, at the end of this project, at the end of next year, we want to make uh, this entire thing open source, right? So that means the code, um, all the all the libraries that are being used as part of the code, as well as uh, the data itself, right? So we chose a data, uh, you know, open data set that that was a requirement. So we chose an open data set for the Illinois system with which we have uh, worked previously, and we have self developed that as well. Um, and it's a, it's a family, um, you know, it's, it's not a simple system. It's not too large a system as well. So it's uh, it's tractable, but we can still uh, try to explore the scalability with the system. Uh, it has about uh, thousand plus. Uh, the graph is about thousand plus nodes for um, the grid side and hundreds of nodes for the for the gas side, right? Um, and uh, and as I mentioned before, this is uh, you know this some of the data is something that we have uh, developed in the past. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, so what you're seeing on screen right now is the overlay graph of the natural gas side plus the you know plus the electric grid uh, graph, right? So the red edges are basically the gas pipelines, um, and uh, it connects the gas-fired power plants. So this is uh, this is some work that we did previously, and what we noticed is that um, if we do have a coordinated setting, so wherein like uh, you can control the flow in all of the interconnected pipelines, then we can actually use the gas-fired generators as a distributed demand response resources, right? And it obviously makes sense because if you uh, if we increase the flow at certain critical nodes at certain critical points in time, then that means like you know we can increase the amount of generation that is uh, that can be produced at that particular gas-fired power plant, right? Uh, but this has to be coordinated. Um, and the second one we noticed was um, if in an in an uncoordinated event. Uh, there is a delivery bottleneck, right? And with a coordinated approach, that delivery bottleneck can be uh, can be mitigated to uh, a large extent. 
And finally, um, all of this additional flexibility will actually lead to um, efficient uh, operation, both on the grid side as well as on the NG side. And these are not um, extrapolations based on the intuitions that we have, but this is an actual uh, study that we did previously, right? And this is what we have been trying to build on. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, um, so how um, how are we? feeding to the Helix development. Well, as I mentioned before, this, co this is a co-optimization problem, right? Uh, and this capability is something that is being improved uh, for Helix, and uh, this use case uh, and the insights that we get from this use case uh, plays a major part in that. Uh, and finally, as uh, Brian and Sergi mentioned before, uh, we are also developing a common interface model for the natural gas, and the goal is to be able to um, you know, choose the simulator uh, that you want and, and write a code only for the domain and not for the simulator. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few days, these cases as well. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, finally, this is the overall approach that we have, um, uh, different components to it, the common interface and the use case development itself. Uh, and this is the interaction between the two labs that are involved in this project. Um, so, um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, that's about, uh, that's about it. Time's up, uh, so any questions? Thanks, uh, Karthik, and also thanks again to uh, Brian Sergi. Um, do we have time for uh, one quick question? Feel free to unmute and ask or raise your hand, or uh, of course, type in the chat. Very cool. Well, I'm um, not hearing or seeing any right now. Again, we'll have a window at the end. Uh, I, think, I think we're still on track for that to have some open discussion with everybody. So uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our next use case, uh, which is actually Karthik again, um, talking about the um, 4.5, uh, looking at transportation and grid. And as you'll hear from Karthik, there are some ties to another project, uh, the Gemini project that's going on at InRail. You'll hear from that presentation um, in the next session, session two for uh, things that are funded outside of the Helix Trust project. Take it away, Karthik. Sounds good. Yeah. So, um, so this is again um, another use case, uh, a collaborative use case of that, uh, where we are looking at the interconnection between uh, the grid side and the transportation side. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so um, so there are two aspects to this. The first component is, uh, you know, to develop a common interface, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, so we do use uh, two different uh, transportation simulators uh, for this use case. One is Polaris, the other one is Beam, and we don't want to write uh, separate federated codes for each of them, right? And that's where the common interface uh, comes into the picture. Um, and uh, the second component of this is to, um, in is, is the actual use case itself, right? And it's, uh, let me let me start by saying that this is a highly exploratory use case. Um, so it's not like uh, we know that if we do X, you're going to get like, you know, Y or Z, right? So we don't know that. What we're trying to find out is like, okay, let's do this and then see what are all the set of things that, uh, you know, we can understand by doing, you know, this and that, right? So that's, that's the kind of approach that we are taking with this use case. Uh, but having said that, the setting at which that, um, we want to study this use case uh, wherein the, we want to study the coupling between the transportation and the grid side, right? It's in an emergency situation. For instance, um, you know, uh, this might be, um, you know, following a disaster event, you might want to uh, restore the power system. And uh, we want to study uh, under, those, under that particular setting, how can um, coupling these two different domains uh, help us, right? And we want to quantify that, not just, uh, you know, study, but we want to quantify, um, you know, that as well. Um, so uh, we are following a couple of parallel approaches. Um, so let's let's call um, the transportation network assets, right? The asset could be uh, an electric vehicle, set of electric vehicles, or it could be um, emergency maintenance crew, right? Um, the key point here is that the transportation network is going to um, allow us to evaluate uh, when and where these critical assets can be placed. Uh, and by doing so, can we actually improve the operation of the grid under this emergency situation that we just talked about. And that's, that's the whole goal. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? OK, so um, so here what you're seeing on screen uh, is a pictorial representation of the common interface that we've been talking about. We talked a little bit about this in the 4.4 use case as well, right? Uh, the concept is uh, still the same. So we do not want to write a simulator specific well, right? because if we do that, then we cannot reuse it, right? For instance, you might have um, you know, we might be developing uh, this for a, 
proprietary uh, simulator and somebody else might not have the license for that. So then that particular code cannot be reused, right? We obviously don't want that. So um, so for as part of the Helix Plus project, uh, we've had this drive um, across different use cases where we want to build out this common interface model, right? So what does that allow us to do? Well, we can write a federal specific code instead of um, you know worrying about the end target simulator, right? Um, so we write a transportation federate code, and that gets translated through the common interface model, um, and whatever be the end target simulator could be Polaris or Beam uh, in this particular case, and then you will still arrive at the same result that you're looking for, right? And that, that's very powerful because it allows reuse of code. So that's one aspect of it, uh, and we've made a lot of progress, um, and um, there are a lot of issues to deal with as well, right? Because uh, different simulators can use uh, different naming conventions, different unit theme, right? And we had to standardize, uh, you know, all of those issues that we just talked about. Um, so then, moving on to the actual use case itself, um, we, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is an exploratory use case. Um, and uh, the first phase for us is to identify the suitable test system and the scenarios, right? And Clemson University is working with us on this, um, and this is a time-consuming process because uh, it, most of it is trial and error. Uh, we have some intuition, uh, but um, it may or may not always pan out, right? Um, so, um, so right now we are exploring um, using the South Carolina synthetic test system uh, for our studies, uh, and it's going on pretty well. We had some um, we had some promising results to start off with. Um, so then uh, we also parallelly we also developed the infrastructure that we would need in order to uh, you know make this happen. Um, so that means uh, Docker images for all of these and so on. Uh, so all the setup is already ready. Um, once we identify the sort of the test system, we are going to explore uh, you know what happens with that. So uh, and uh, primarily we want to um, we want to quantify the difference between a siloed and a coupled approach. Uh, basically, the decoupled, uh, just the grid alone, versus the transportation plus grid. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so we use Helix uh, for message passing and time synchronization because these are different um, you know different programs running uh, a separate uh, separate processes. Right. Uh, we want to be able to exchange messages and um, synchronize uh, the messages with the time as well. Uh, so that's why we use Helix, and um, Helix allows us to, uh, you know, make this happen without additional effort from our side. Um, and also, uh, the common interface. Uh, this is this use case is feeding into the Helix project because the common interface is, uh, in in my opinion, at least, it's it's, it's a critical um, component uh, in order for the user to be able to reuse the code. Um, and uh, finally, uh, to the last slide. Um, for the common interface, we are using two different transportation simulators, Polaris and Beam, as proof of concept. Uh, but the common interface itself is adapted, uh, including additional, uh, you know, simulators as well, right? Um, and the study is to, um, you know, quantify the interdependence between the two different uh, networks. Um, and we talked a little bit about that. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I'll stop right here, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Karthik. Uh, sorry also for the little bit of a jumpiness on the timer. I realized I'd cut you a little short. Um, so thanks for finishing up on that on time. And also, uh, just for all the presenters, there seems to be some strange gesture that occasionally moving my mouse causes it to dance. So sorry for the occasional back and forth on the slides. Um, but are there any, uh, I, I see that uh, um, I, I, it looks like it's Venkat Aswara, although I'm not sure if you might go by Venkat, uh, has a great question that we'll save for the, um, the closing discussion. Um, but any specifics on this use case uh, for Karthik? Okay, well, uh, not hearing any, we'll move on to our, our last uh, of these use cases before the sort of open discussion. Um, so Anadeep from um, Idaho uh, National Lab is gonna talk about a telecommunications and hardware in the loop uh, use case that they've embarked on. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I hope you're able to hear me clearly. We can hear you, thanks. Perfect. Uh, so hi, uh, this is Anudeep Minam. I'm a power and energy system research engineer here at uh, INL. Uh, this is a telecommunication case, and as Brian just explained, we will be looking at the telecommunication as well as hardware in the loop uh, capability and seeing how exactly can we use the Helix Plus tool for the co-simulation. Uh, next slide, Brian. So uh, we would be, the overall objective is to perform a real-time co-simulation, which would have both, all the three, transmission, distribution, and communication uh, using the Helix platform. And when I say real-time, uh, we are looking at the 
time step of around 50 microsecond. And this is important because whenever we are doing any kind of uh, simulation, especially if we are adding any of the DERs or any of the loads, we see that we have a lot of transients. And this is something you can only uh, kind of observe it when you are doing the real time simulation. And with this particular, in this particular case, we would be looking at uh, also the we're in the loop capability where we will be adding some of the DRs like solar PV or uh, or any of the other loads like electrolyzer or something. So we would like to see what would be the impact of these DRs on the distribution system. And if at all, if there is any fault on the transmission side and what would be the impact of that due to some faulty communication on the distribution side. Uh, next slide, Brian. So uh, on the right hand side, you can see the co-simulation test setup where we would be modeling a transmission system in an Opal RT and a distribution system where we have partnered with Ida Falls Power and they will, we will be using their distribution system and we will be modeling it in RTDS or RS scan. And we would be adding a solar PV as a DER and connecting it at the distribution end. Uh, so we, if at all there is a fault at the transmission side and there is a faulty communication, it could be a packet loss or packet delay. And we would like to see what would be the impact on the distribution side. And also the also vice versa, where whenever we add a DER, uh, how does it impact the transmission side? And uh, many a times uh, when we try to lump the DER loads, uh, we just take it as real power and we just do a dynamic load. But uh, when you do the co-simulation, you actually see the differences between adding the distribution system as a lump load on the transmission side. And this is what we would also like to investigate further doing this co-simulation. Uh, next slide, Brian. So uh, what is a hel uh, helix alloy? So the main ob objective is to use the real-time component uh, and develop it in the helix platform. And uh, as many of the use cases, as you would have seen, they have used PSSE, uh, MATLAB, and stuff. So we would like to use Helix for RSCAD as well, uh, which is a proprietary tool from RTDS. And this is one of the largest vendors where we use for the real-time uh, operation. So this is something which would be beneficial for the uh, public in the end. So this is what we'll be trying to showcase. Next slide, Brian. So the path forward is uh, now we have just used the solar PV and trying to look at the hardware in the loop simulation. But as we move forward, we would like to look at, say, a microgrid or other loads like electric wakers or electrolyzers to study the impacts on the grid and do the co simulation. And next, I think that's it from me. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks to Ido Force Power and for partnering with us and help giving us the distribution system. Um, any questions? I would be happy to answer. Thanks uh, much, Andy. Um, any questions on on this recent presentation? Oh, looks like there's a question for Venkat in the chat about how many RTDS racks are involved in your study. So we are currently uh, using two racks, uh, two Nova Core racks, uh, but. Uh, it depends on, we still haven't gone to that stage yet, uh, but as of now, two Nova course racks. Great, thanks. There's also a question from uh, Peter Polanski uh, about will you also have communication hardware in the loop? Uh, yes, so uh, oh, I guess I did not mention that point. So yes, uh, we would be using the NS3, uh, that is a network simulator 3. So we would be doing the communication uh, simulation using that NS3. And that is where we will be doing our uh, packet loss and packet delay. In the system. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then there, uh, there's a question from Naeem, or whether on the Opal side you're using eMegaSim or eFaserSim. We are using eMegaSim for now. Excellent, thanks. <laughs> Peter uh, has clarified that his question around uh, communications in the loop was around real switches, where they had actual hardware devices there in the loop. Oh, um, I don't think so. Uh, we are not looking at that particular aspect, no. Great, uh, thanks much. Um, well, we've got a few minutes left here, 
So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause the questions around this particular use case, um, and we'll move on to our sort of panel discussion here. Um, so th this is a quick reminder. I'm not going to leave this up the whole time because I'm hoping that our uh, respondents will be able to use their video. But just th these are the uh, six use cases that um, we've seen and uh, the presenter from each of those. Um, so if anybody has um, some specific questions for this team, um, this is a good time to ask. I'll go ahead and back in the history. Uh, we had a question from Jing earlier around uh, convergence issues with transmission and distribution and, and how um, do you resolve this issue? So I think that was sort of addressed directed towards um, Otto, but uh, it could also be a general question. Uh, yeah, so so um, co-convergence issues typically arise from uh, discrete states, right? So a tap changer might change, uh, might be might, might be very sensitive to to voltage, right? And the voltage is coming from the boundary condition from the transmission side, which means that you're trying to co-converge. You might see tap changes to and from a particular point, and you never actually converge to a steady state solution. Uh, what we intend to do here is is build out uh, a co-convergence helper federate. And that felt federate would essentially have a much more information that it would use solvers like uh, uh, like the Sundial so solver suite and use and use the information to to help us converge in, in a much more efficient manner. Brian, I think you're you're on mute. You're muted. Uh, thank you. Yes, sorry about that. Um, also a question in the chat from Venkat. Um, he says, uh, nice talks. Can you elaborate um, on various time scales for interesting time scale stages for very for interesting co-simulations? Do you, do there are there any studies involving the effects of time delays in validation? I think this is a, a general question. Um, to, to everyone, and so uh, feel free to whoever wants to go first. We could try to answer that on the various time scales for co-simulation and effects of time delays and validation. So I can go first um, on this. So this is part. Uh, go ahead, Tarthik. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead, Adil. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, so the use cases I'm developing, we'll be covering both dynamic and steady state. So we, so the simulation I just showed you was what the quarter cycle time step. And then for steady sets, we'll, we'll be looking at minutes and, and hours. Great, thanks, uh, Karthik. Um, yeah, um, so this is a general observation, right? Um, so so for all of the co-simulation, so um, that we um, typically presented here, um, correct me if I'm wrong, so we do not have, you know, include the communication delay except for uh, 4.6 uh, perhaps. Uh, but having said that, um, if we want to understand the effect of like um, you know communication delays on wide area control, for instance, right? Uh, there is established theory, uh, delay differential equations, uh, you know, delay DAEs, right? Uh, and uh, and they gave us a give us an upper bound on uh, you know what kind of performance that we can expect. Uh, but um, uh, you know, but uh, you know, T plus D plus P uh, would answer the question uh, in a more empirical manner, the, the one that you raised, uh, but uh, so far we haven't explored that in uh, high detail. I would just like to add to what Karthik said. Uh, this is in terms of uh, use case 4.1. So we are solving basically the market and our time steps were mostly five minute market and a day ahead market, but in, in between those five minute markets, we are micro stepping to 10 millisecond level just to emulate communication. And then Helix offers some inherent uh, pseudocom modules in which you can uh, hard code delays in through distributions and then we're using that to study the impact uh, in the data exchange during the distributed market. Great, thanks. Um, any other uh, comments from uh, other presenters on time series? I, in particular, I think that um, you know, a number of people, I, I believe, uh, mentioned the idea of looking at time delays. Uh, I can imagine there being two pieces of that time delay those delays which are introduced as a result of co-simulation, and then also those delays that are simulated um, in terms of communication or other types of physical delays that are done in simulation. Yes, yeah, Brian, for the gas case, um, 
we aren't simulating delayed communications, but I think one thing that is interesting here is that gas obviously operates at a much slower time scale than the power sector, right? So power is instantaneous. The gas can take uh, minutes or hours to get up to pressure or line pack or things like that. And so generally, I think we'll be looking at time scales of maybe 15 minutes to hourly simulations, but simulating dynamic gas uh, operations to try to capture the essentially, essentially the delay in response to signals from uh, redispatch in the power sector. Great, thanks. Uh, any other additional comments from folks? Great, well, uh, not hearing any. Um, see if there's any other questions here in the chat. Um, looks like there's a question to Adel about what uh, type of open source platforms are you planning to use for dynamic and steady state simulations, if any? And what time steps are you looking at? That's a question from uh, Usama. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so for the open open source uh, examples, uh, I'll be using OpenDSS given we have a very robust uh, Helix interface already developed uh, for OpenDSS. Uh, for the transmission side, I'm still open to open to uh, 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 to suggestions, right? Uh, I, I might use Panda Power just because I have experience working with that for now, but that is limited to steady state, right? Uh, for for dynamics, I uh, I don't know uh, which would be a nice solver to use. Certainly welcome. Any just additions if people have uh, have thoughts in that space? We can also connect uh, offline if that's helpful. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to pop on one last uh, time here with uh, um, that uh, sort of announcement of our need to transition to another venue for our next session. Um, Jason has just uh, pasted this in the in the chat window, which is very helpful. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and wrap up this first session. And our, our next one is a continuation of this um, session to our lightning round, trying to look at a large number of presentations from around the labs and beyond who are also using Helix. Um, information is shown here on the screen, although it's probably a lot easier to type because you can't click these uh, from the uh, link that Jason sent in the chat. So thanks again to all our presenters and look forward to seeing you in the next meeting shortly.